All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah, sounds like the mic's working. So um, I will try and talk very loud, and hopefully everyone in the back can hear me. Um, so uh, presentation today is, is um, a brief look at different strategies you can use and ways to kind of optimize VM images um, for use with um, KVM and, and, and Kimu as your, as your hypervisor. Um, and uh, I think you all know who I am probably. You read it on the, on the uh, info about this talk. And, and basically, I work for a company called MetaCloud. We manage clouds for large companies. Um, so uh, a, a few notes quickly to talk about here about this presentation. Um, as I said in my, in my uh, kind of prospectus for the talk, there's, there's literally hundreds of different combinations of tools disk formats, container formats, versions of the software that you can use. And there's a ton of different ways to run images on actually a ton of different hypervisors. We're only talking about KVM Kimu here today because we've got a little less than 40 minutes to get it all in, which is really not a lot of time. So we make a couple assumptions in this talk. Um, the assumptions are up there. You know, We use particular versions, you know, OpenStack Grizzly, um, particular versions of Kimu, libvirt, and then in general, we're talking about using Ubuntu and RHEL, um, fairly modern versions of those, um, as our as our guest VMs. Um, so, um, and like I said, there's, there's there's so many different ways to do this. The original version of this talk I, I built had like 80 slides, and I was like, well, I don't have four hours, so I got to cut that down to 20. Um, so this is just one way of doing it, and it's the way. Um, that we now recommend for all of our clients, and this is based upon several years of us uh, of us working with OpenStack and KVM and, and the underlying technologies. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that and the trade-offs there. Um, so the the high-level um, presentation here, I'm going to talk a little bit about what this notion of a disk format and a container format is, and we're going to again tons of different options there. We're going to focus on raw and QCAL2 as our disk formats. And then we're going to talk about AMI, which is um, it's a container format and kind of a disk format and a bunch of other stuff. Um, then we're going to actually step through kind of the, the very high level of what happens when you launch an instance in Nova. This is using OpenStack Grizzly. What does it do with your image? And what does that mean? Um, and then uh, we're going to delve into uh, a bit about prepping um, the OS inside the image, because that's, that's the other half. We are focusing on on Linux, um, sorry, no Windows stuff here. Um, there's a lot of information about Windows, but again, you know, we have to concentrate on something. Um, and then finally, there's just you know a final putting it all together to show you kind of the, the recommendations all together uh, as as one thing. Uh, so um, tools for manipulating disk images. Um, there's there's a number of great tools out there uh, and different ways in which you can you can. Um, you can manipulate these. The, the kind of the tools we use every day um, uh, at MetaCloud for, for manipulating images and working with client images um, are the ones that are up here. So from the Kimu project itself, um, we use the Kimu image command and Kimu NBD. So Kimu image really is your, your Swiss army knife. Um, it can read and understand a number of different formats. It can convert. Uh, files between about, I think it's like 12 to 15 different disk formats, um, VMDKs from VMware, all, all types of different stuff. So it's a great, it can also resize a number of different disk formats. So it's a great Swiss Army knife uh, for, for working with it. Um, Kimu NBD is a great tool for using to mount QCAL disk files directly. Um, it will open them up, look at the partition structure, build block devices so that you can then treat them as block devices and, and, and use them uh, for manipulating them. There's also another great project out there called libguestfs. Uh, if you guys haven't heard about it or seen it, I highly recommend you check it out. It's a wonderful project, um, and it provides a, a ton of tools. The ones we primarily use is, is guest mount. It's another way of mounting uh, file systems. You can mount QCAL2. You can mount RAW. It actually supports mounting a, a number of different um, uh, formats as well, but it does require fuse. Um, uses a, a, a fuse mount to do that. Um, and finally, Vert File Systems, which is another Swiss Army knife, if you will. I didn't want to use the same term twice. Uh, for looking at, um, it's really great at examining the partition structure inside RAWs. That's, that's what we primarily use it for. But it supports a, a number of different formats again. Um, OK, so formats. I keep mentioning disk formats and that sort of stuff. So, so what am I talking about here? Well, there's, there's in, in OpenStack and in Glance, there's two um, types of formats that come into play. 
There's your disk format, and there's your container format. The disk formats are what I think most of us are, are, are fairly familiar with. And so a disk format is, is a format for a file for storing, basically, partition and block information. And there's a lot of those. VMDK is the popular one from VMware. RAW and QCAL2 are, are the two most popular for, the, um, for KVM. Um, and, and those are the two we're going to focus on here. Um, there's also this notion of a container format, which is a, a less talked about subject in, and um, you know, less probably um, dependent thing. But um, what a container format is, is it's a way of saying, well, I can take a disk file, which is like some block info, and I can associate some metadata with that, that block info. Um, that, that block file, and that tells me something when I launch the VM. It, it gives me some extra pointers of things to do. Um, so a container format or a container file typically contains a disk formatted file as well. Um, and one of the more popular ones is, is AMI, and, and we'll be talking about a little bit about AMI. Um, so raw disk format, what is it? Um, well, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a direct representation of the disk. Um, imagine if you... You took your hard drive, and you just DD'd it, and you DD'd it to a file. That's a raw. That's, that's basically what a raw is. It's a direct copy of everything that's present on the physical drive. It includes your partitioning structure, your boot sector if you have it, all your data blocks, everything. Um, raw, raw disks can be sparse. If you're storing a raw disk file on a file system that supports sparse, it will be sparse, AKA the underlying file system will not actually write out all those zeros. Um, it's probably one of the most widely supported formats out there because it is so basic. It's just a disk in a file. Um, and it, it can basically be treated as a block device. It's fairly easy with a raw to manipulate that in, in Linux operating systems. Um, you, can, you can use things like file to look at the structure, fdisk to look at the structure. If you know your offsets, you can just directly mount it. Um, QCAL2 disk format, that's the other popular one we hear a lot about. Um, so this is the Kimu copy on write version 2 format. Um, it was developed as part of the Kimu project. Um, it supports a number of features. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the great ones is it can do pre-allocation as well as on-demand allocation of blocks. So what do I mean by that? Well, raw, as we talked about previously, is just an exact copy. Every block is there. Now, if you're storing on a sparse file system, we don't copy every block, but every block is there. A QCAL2 can be made to do that. You can create one with pre-allocation. You can also request on-demand allocation. And what that means is when you can create the file, you say, I want this file to support 100 gigs, but we don't need to write or create 100 gigs worth of, worth of blocks in there. We just say this file will grow to that maximum size. So that provides a little bit of a, of a performance improvement in that we don't have to pre-allocate it, at least at launch time. Now, obviously. When we're actually running and writing to that, there's a little bit of an overhead because whereas with raw, we already have a block available. We just put the data in here. We have to create the block, update the disk structure, and, and add that. So it's kind of a trade-off. Um, there's also a number of features inherent to the QCAL2 format. So this is different than what Nova or libvirt supports. This is just inherent into the image format or the disk format itself. Um, you can have read-only backing files. So that's a pretty cool, a cool feature, actually. What it means is I can take a raw file, um, as an example, and I can then create a QCAL2 based on that raw. And I can say, this QCAL2 uses this raw file as a read-only back. And when I create that, that QCAL2 contains no data. It's basically just a pointer to that raw. And if I were to load that QCAL2, it would see everything that's in that raw and present it and read from it. Now, as I start writing, I'm not writing back to the raw. I'm writing into the QCAL2. That's kind of where the copy on write part of it comes into play. QCAL2 also supports snapshots. You can do those both internally in the file as well as have uh, external files and, and have this notion of chaining uh, snapshots and chaining uh, backing files. Uh, it also supports compression using Zlib. It's an option you can request, as well as encryption. Um, and it supports um, AES uh, on the encryption, and I think there might be one other, but. So those are all, like I said, built into the file format itself. Um, OK, so differences. I mean, I kind of talked about it, but let's spell it out here. Raw versus QCAL2. Raw has uh, very, very little overhead. It's an exact copy of, of what's on your hard disk. Um, so as a result of that, it, it has a performance advantage. All the blocks are pre-allocated. 
it's, it's just a straight copy. There's no overhead of a actual file format layer or anything you have to do there. So there's a performance advantage. Um, QCAL2, on the other hand, is designed for virtualization. Um, and it's actively developed. Um, a lot of folks at Red Hat, I think there might be a few in the room, you know, actively work on it as well as a, a wide community. And so it's, it's built with this notion of it's going to be used for VMs. It's going to be used in clouds. What are the features we need for that? What are the, the things it needs to do? Um, also, as we pointed out, QCAL2 supports snapshots. So I have a little star next to that. What do I mean by that? Well, as a disk format, RAW doesn't support snapshots. There's no notion of a snapshot in the disk format. There is with QCAL2. However, with Grizzly, there was functionality added for this notion of live snapshotting. So if you're using libvirt and KVM and you have a raw-based file, you can use live snapshotting. Now, that was designed and implemented to improve snapshotting with QCAL2s. But in theory, it should also work with raw files. I say in theory uh, because as far as I know, no one's actually used that feature in Grizzly with a raw file yet, but it, it should work. <laughs> um, so. Uh, uh, Continuing on the, on the differences, um, QTAL2s with a read-only backing file have a couple of advantages, like I talked about. First off, faster instance launching. So why? Well, I have a backing file. All I have to do is create the QCAL2 um, file and point it at the backing file, and it's available. I don't have to copy the backing file. I don't have to make a copy of it as if I was launching it as a raw. Um, additionally, the, the size of it or the resize of it can be represented virtually. What do I mean by that? Well, a raw, like I said, has every block in there. So if I want to resize a, a raw, I actually have to allocate all those blocks. With a QCAL2, if you're using on-demand allocation, you just change the size. This is now going to be 100 gigs. There's a Kimu image command to do that. So you just change the size. You don't have to allocate a bunch of additional blocks. So that's, that's faster. Um, there's also an increase in storage efficiency for using a QCAL2. You don't have to duplicate the base images. Um, as we'll see later on, with, with what Nova does and the way it actually launches a VM, if you're using RAW, you have to copy all that data for each VM if it's based on a RAW. With a QCAL2, you don't. It's one copy, stored in format, and then you can have 100 VMs all launch with a QCAL2 based on that same file. So you don't have to, it allows you to do uh, basically thin provisioning of your storage or much uh, a much greater level of thin provisioning than you might normally be able to do. So um, AMI, this is the container format I talked about. And it's a bit of an identity crisis. <laughs> um, what do I mean by an identity crisis? Well, AMI can be used to describe um, a container, which is what I talked about. It can also be used to describe a file, for, a disk format. And an AMI also contains a raw. So it's kind of a, a bunch of things all, all rolled into one. What is it really? Well. AMI is actually three distinct files um, that are used together. So the first file is called an AMI. So it's an Amazon machine image. It's actually a raw file. It's just a disk file in raw format. But it contains no partition info in, in it, just a file system. Um, so this is a bit of an interesting concept. You don't technically need a partition to put a file system on a disk. You could just take the raw device, dev SDA as an example, and you could run makefs on it and put a file system on there. You can also add partitioning information, add a boot sector, add grub, do all those things if you want to. For an AMI, it's a raw disk with no partitioning info, just a file system. The other two files, an AKI and an ARI. AKI, Amazon kernel image, it's a VM Linus. Um, ARI, Amazon RAM disk image, it's an init or D. There's nothing special about these files. They don't have to be modified to support AMI, just a kernel and an init or D. Um, an AMI, the AMI file, is booted using its associated ARI and AKI. So you don't need a kernel or a NITRD inside the AMI. In fact, it's not used. You basically use the AKI or the ARI that's associated with it. So launching an instance, how do we, how do we actually launch an instance in Nova? Um, so we start with a user selecting an image and a flavor. There's a bunch of other information they can do. We know this. What's important is the image and the flavor for, for this conversation. That request is then sent to the scheduler, Nova Scheduler. Nova Scheduler picks a node, says, hey, compute, go do this. Launch a VM for me with the following information. 
Nova Compute then moves through a series of tasks. And the first thing it has to do is it has to say, OK, I have to make sure that image is available to me. Um, so the images, uh, as they're downloaded from Glance, are stored in the instance underscore dir slash underscore base. So think of this like a local cache on each compute node of the images. This is done because it allows us to speed up image launching. If it's the same image used, say, hundreds and hundreds of times, I don't have to re-download it every time from Glance. So it's going to check there to say, hey, I've been told to use this image. Do I already have a copy of this image? If it doesn't, it's going to make a call to Glance, say, hey, Glance, I need this image. Download it. Um, and then what it's going to do is it's going to take a look at the, uh, at the image it was given. If that image is not in the raw format, it's going to convert it to raw. So this is something that's really important. It's actually a bit shocking to me the first time I read the code. It doesn't matter what you store it in in Glance as. You can store it as a QCOW2. You can st store it in a number of different formats. It's converted to raw by Nova Compute. And it stores its local cached copy as a raw. Um, and it's, again, it's stored in the instance dir underscore base. Then what it does is it says, great, I have the image. I need to create the disk file. The disk files are instance dir, instance UUID, disk. Um, that's what we think of as our, as our root disk for our VMs. Um, now, the next steps will, will vary depending upon the format you're using. So if you're using a QCAL2, um, this is actually the default Nova. When you launch a VM in Nova with the default configuration, it will make the root disk file a QCAL2 that has a read-only backing file of the raw image it just downloaded and or converted from Glance. It'll be a dynamically allocated file, as in it will not pre-allocate all the blocks. It'll just be a pointer. Um, backing file of the previously downloaded image. And then it sets the disk size. So again, this is an, an interesting feature of the way Nova works. In a flavor, you can specify a size for the disk. 10 gigs, 20 gigs, 30 gigs. You can also specify 0, no size. That causes a little bit of a different bit of behavior in Nova. If a size is set, when that QCAL2 image is created, it sets that QCAL2 image to be whatever the size you specified in the flavor was. If on the other hand, there is no size set, then it doesn't specify a size other than the size of the, of the backing file. What this actually means then is if you create a really, really small image and you leave no free space and then you fail to set a flavor size, you'll boot your VM up and <laughs> you'll have no space. Um, also, it does mean that if you have a really large image, let's say 100 gigs is how big your image size is, and you set a flavor size to 50 gigs, when you try and launch the instance, it'll actually fail to launch. Nova will detect, well, you have 100 gigs here. You're trying to create something that's 50 gigs. Those don't match. There's no way you can fit 150, and it'll fail. And it'll actually fail with, a, with an error that indicates, hey, the, the flavor size is too small. You, you can't contain that image in here. Um, if it's a raw, it's a little bit different. So like I said, QCOW2 is the default. So in order to launch a raw, you need to set a flag. Um, the flags use underscore cow underscore images equals false. Um, if you just set that flag, by default, it'll then create the disk files as raw. There's an additional set of flags you have to pass to libvirt if you want to use some more exotic formats. Um, but the default, if you just tell Nova not to use a cow image, is raw. Um, in that case, what happens is a copy of that backing image is made. So that raw file that we downloaded from Glance and stored, we make a copy of that, complete copy. And then we resize it. So again, this is different than QCAL2. Since our QCAL2s were dynamically allocated, we could just set the size. We actually have to perform a resize operation here. Again, it's resized to the size of the flavor specified in or, ooh, It's resized to the size of the disk specified in the flavor, or it's just left to the original size. Again, all the same rules apply. If it's too small, it'll fail. Um, What's interesting to know about this resize here with raw and with QCAL2 is all we're doing here is we're resizing the maximum size of the disk file. So what, what that's analogous to is if I had a 10 gig hard drive in my computer and I ran out of space and I went and I bought a 20 gig hard drive and I put that in there and I DD'd all the data off that 10 gig drive and put it on my 20 gig drive and then booted from my 20 gig drive, what would happen? All I did was DD it, I'd have a full 10 gig partition and then I'd have 10 gigs of unallocated blocks, because they're not part of any partition, and they're not part of any file system yet. 
So all Nova's handling here is resizing the disk file and the, and the underlying disk and, and what its maximum size could be. Doesn't change anything inside the operating system with the partitions or file systems. That, that comes later via another tool. Um, so that other tool is, is cloud in it. So the next kind of part of uh, portion of this, of this presentation is, is around how you prep the OS. Um, at that point, you've got a VM, it's running. Nova boots it. It does the rest of the stuff that, that Nova needs to do. You know, got to get networks, got to get IPs, got to get it booted, configure, you know, create an image in libvirt, all that sort of stuff. That all happens, gets booted. What happens next? Well, if you've prepped your image properly, you can actually accomplish a couple of things, again, through some of the, the functionality either built into Nova or by using uh, third-party tools. So inside the OS, there's a couple of things that, that we always prep. One is, is cloud init. Um, and that's what handles a lot of our uh, of the image resizing, or sorry, the file system resizing for us. Um, authentication, again, is just going to boot that image. So how do you log into it? How do you authenticate to it? How do you use it? Networking, there's a couple of actually interesting things around networking. By default, the image boots. It's got an IP address assigned. And how does it get the network info? It needs to DHCP it. At least that's the general assumption. Uh, and finally, if you've got volumes that you want to attach, how does that work? Well, you need the hot plug functionality in the Linux kernel, um, and, and we'll talk about that as well. So Cloudinit, probably the most interesting part of it. So Cloudinit's a project that's a, a tool. It's a great tool. It's developed by um, Canonical, the folks behind Ubuntu. Um, and it's designed to help solve a number of these, what do I do now that the instance is up? How do I log in? How do I set its host name? How do I set its network info? Um, so it actually does a lot of stuff, um, way more than, than um, we use it for, or most people do, for that matter. Um, you can read all about it. Um, the primary thing we use it for is, is leveraging Nova's metadata, metadata API, which is an EC2 compatible metadata API. Um, the metadata API is, is really a concept that was originally created by Amazon for EC2. It's, it's re-implemented in Nova. It's actually a very, very powerful feature if you've never played with it. It allows you, as part of an instance, to set arbitrary data that is then available inside that instance by making a specific call to a specific URL. That URL is always the same. It's, it's a link local address. Um, and, and so it, it allows you to dynamically seed data, if you will, into your image or into your instance. Um, and then if you have the right tools configured to run and look at that metadata, it can take action based upon the data it finds. Um, the other stuff that, that Cloudinit does for us here is it provides the functionality, like I said, for, for doing the file system resizing. So um, Cloudinit can, can uh, use something, it can, can um, grow the size of a file system, but of course it can only grow a file system to the maximum size of the partition. Um, since an AMI has no partition table, that means it can grow it to the maximum size of the underlying disk file that we resized. Um, Ubuntu also provides an, an add-on tool called Cloud, uh, cloud init RAM FS Grow Root. Um, this is something that they've integrated with their initRDs. And, uh, and what it allows it to do is it can repartition the underlying disk structure. So if your underlying disk actually has a partition structure, you know, you did the classic, I'm you know, putting temp here, I'm, I'm putting slash here, I'm putting boot over here. Um, it can do that. Now, uh, as far as I know, that's only available for Ubuntu. Uh, Red Hat does not have it. Unfortunately, the, the, the Red Hat and are uh, structured a little differently. Um, I, that may have changed recently, <laughs> but uh, as far as I know, there's, there's no equivalent in anything other than Ubuntu as a, as a guest OS. Um, how to install it? Um, Ubuntu and RHEL, pretty easy. It's, it's available as, as part of the um, default repositories for Ubuntu, so you can just go ahead and install it. Uh, for RHEL and CentOS, it's not part of, of the core OS, but the uh, EPEL has it. Um, so if you're not familiar with the EPEL, it's a set of enterprise tested and vetted packages that are made available for um, RHEL and, and CentOS. So if you configure uh, those app, uh, YUM repos, you can go ahead and install CloudNet from there. Or of course, you can build it, download it, and roll it yourself if you want. <laughs> um, what's the configuration? Uh, well, we actually use a very, very basic configuration because this goes along with 
the way we do networking, the way we recommend our clients do authentication and everything. Um, so basically, three elements there, user cloud, all that does is say, um, you know, when you run and you look at the EC2 API, if you find SSH keys and, you, and you're going to drop them into a user's directory, drop those SSH keys into the cloud user's directory. So um, I should back up and actually talk about that, I suppose. <laughs> you know, in Horizon, you can, you can create SSH keys, and when you launch an instance, you can specify an SSH key. You can also do that through the uh, Nova API if you want. That's what Cloudnet does, is it reads that data and it says, oh, I'm going to download that key, and I'm going to install that into the cloud user's uh, home directory. Disable root, make sure the root user is, is basically disabled from, from SSH access. Why? Well, what's the password? And also, why are you SSHing in as root? <laughs> uh, preserve hostname false. Um, so this is actually because Cloudnet can reconfigure the hostname. So you can set a hostname as part of launching an instance. And if you have Cloudnet and you say preserve hostname false, it'll actually reconfigure the hostname for that instance to be the one you set. So it'll come up and already have your hostname. Um, the final thing, which is important only for Ubuntu, is by default when you install Cloudnet, it can look at a number of different data sources. Only one of those is the, is the metadata service or the EC2 service. That's not enabled by default in a default install. So you want to go, go through and enable that because that's the only metadata service that we have available um, at boot time inside the, uh, the, the image. Um, so now, authentication models. This is getting way more into um, recommendation. Again, there's a lot of different ways to do this. What, what, what we, we recommend and, and what we assume is we need to provide a set of images. They're going to be brought up and booted to a state where they're in a known state whereby the client's configuration management system can take over and turn that instance into something meaningful for them. Whether that's a web server, a database server, an application server, you know, whatever it ends up being. So a lot of these recommendations are assuming that this is not the end. This is only the beginning. This is the, the basic seed point. And after this point, your standard process, whatever that is, puppet, chef, salt, um, someone doing it by hand following, <laughs> following a guide, you know, whatever that's going to be, is going to be run. This is just a, an initial starting point at which you can then configure this instance to be something meaningful for you. Um, so what do we do when we prep an instance? Well, we disable the root login via SSH. Um, Cloudnet also does this. We just make sure. <laughs> um, we also configure it so that anyone who's a member of the, the allowed pseudo user or allowed pseudo groups um, can do so without a password so that we don't have to have a preset password for the cloud user and then share it out because if there's a preset password and you share it to everyone, it's basically like having no password. What's the point? Uh, so for Ubuntu, that's the, the pseudo group. In RHEL, the standard is to use the wheel group. Um, the other stuff we do is we go ahead and we create that cloud user and we add it to that pseudo or wheel group. So that user's available, and they have basically full root access. The expectation is this is how someone's going to log in. Um, they can log in over SSH using that cloud user. They seeded their key, Cloudnet installed it. They can SSH in as the cloud user, become root, run their configuration management system, do what they need. So we add the user, and then we basically um, we lock the password, aka it's an unhashable password. You can't kind of like saying there's no password. It, it doesn't exist. Um, so if you try to log in on the console, you, you couldn't. The account's locked, if you will. Finally, what we do is we set up the root account, and we actually allow it to only log in on the console without a password. Um, yeah, there's no gasp. OK, I figured when I said there's no root password, everyone was gonna, someone was going to be like, what are you talking about? Why do you do this? You know, well, so. All we've done is made sure that root can log in on the console. And we've, in fact, disabled its ability to log in everywhere else. We don't install an SSH key for it. We don't allow it to log in via SSH. It can only be logged in on the console. And again, we're talking about an OpenStack instance. Isn't that insecure? Could be. But let's think about this. So again, it's an instance. Everyone in the company is going to be launching this. So everyone's going to have this root password. How secure is that? It's not. Also, you can only log in on the console. Well, let's think about it. If you have console access, or if you have the ability to get a console through OpenStack, what else can you do? You can snapshot that. You can boot that up someplace else and attach that if you want to. You can destroy that VM. You basically have full control. You own the hardware, uh, in essence. Now, 
with the newer Keystone V3 API, as support for that starts coming into the tools, there's a lot more granular access. And you could say something like, this user can look at the console, but they can't do anything else. So as that evolves, we'll need to change some of these recommendations. But for now, with Folsom and now Grizzly, it's fairly safe and secure because otherwise either everyone has the password and or they basically own the hardware. Um, so networking, that was kind of the, how we set up the authentication stuff, the networking piece. Um, so when you launch an instance, uh, Nova picks a, a unique, or Nova Network or Quantum, picks a unique MAC address for you and assigns that to the instance. The OS itself can sometimes be configured in a way where it's holding on to its old MAC address and it doesn't want to use that new one. It wants to set its MAC address. In a cloud, of course, this can be really bad. If you have an instance that's got a hard-coded MAC address and then you spawn 500 of these, uh, you're going to have a layer two mess on your hands. So you need to make sure that the OS is prepped in a way so it's not holding on to any old information of, uh, about its MAC address. There's a couple of different ways to do that. Uh, first off, there's, there's UDEV and UDEV rules. Um, so you want to go ahead and just remove the existing uh, 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 net rules and also disable the, um, uh, the writer for it. We don't really need it to rewrite uh, our net rules files for us because in most cases there's only one interface. It's not going to change. It's got a fixed MAC address. We don't really need UDEV to try and figure out have we added more and reorder stuff for us. Um, in RHEL, uh, you also want to make sure that your, your actual um, if CFG uh, uh, files don't have a HW adder specified that can be specified in there. So you want to go through and make sure that these are all cleaned up so that it'll actually use the MAC address of, of the card that's configured for it or the virtual interface that's configured for it. Um, the next step is DHCP. So in Nova, the expected way to configure the network is for the instance to come up and DHCP all of its info. Additionally, we kind of prefer that instances keep DHCPing. That way, as cloud administrators, if we need to change information about the network, we can kind of do so dynamically and then let the, uh, um, uh, let the VMs pick that up by, by, by DHCPing uh, the new info. So we need to make sure that the instances, when they come up, are configured to, um, to be persistent with their DHCP, if you will, to keep trying. What you don't want is an instance to come up and boot and say, I'm going to try and get an address. I failed to get an address because there was some network interruption. I'm giving up. At that point, you've basically got a VM that will never get on the network until an administrator you know, logs in onto the console and, and, and runs some commands. That's not really useful. Again, the goal here is to try and automate as much as possible. The goal here is to boot the instance up into a state where if you're good, then something like a chef or a puppet automatically takes over and configures the node for you. So we want it to keep trying. That's also true for when we're renewing a lease. We don't want it to try and renew the lease, fail to renew the lease because some transient network issue, and then say, well, I'm giving up. I'm unconfiguring my interface, and hey, admin, come, come reboot me or, or, or manually fix me. Um, so it turns out <laughs> RHEL and CentOS and Ubuntu all by default want to try once and then give up, which is not very cloud friendly. Um, so you need, to, you need to change that. So on RHEL and CentOS, it's, it's pretty easy. Again, in your ifcfg file, you just say persistent dh client equals yes, and RHEL does the right thing. With Ubuntu, it's, it's a little fuzzier. Um, if up, which is how, uh, in general, with if, uh, the way networking is brought up in Ubuntu is using the if up binary. And when you've got your Etsy network interfaces file configured for DHCP, if up sees that and it, it kind of runs through a set of steps. The first thing it does is it says, well, or one of the first things it does is say, if I have DH client three, if basically SBIN DH client three exists, I'm going to use that. And here's a hard coded set of flags I will pass to it. And one of those flags that it passes is minus one. For DH client, that basically means try once and, and give up. That's not ideal. Um, so what we actually do is actually just remove DH client three from, from the Ubuntu images. Um, we've also played around with it. There is a DH client config file. Certain combinations of, of the timeout and retry values seem to cause the client to persist, but we've had variable luck with that depending upon the version of Ubuntu. And we know for a fact that if we remove DH client three, it doesn't run it with a device one flag, falls back to DH client, which in case anyone's ever looked in Ubuntu, DH client three is the same thing as DH client. It's just a sim link. So removing the sim link actually is, is for all intents and purposes, doesn't really change much other than if up says, oh, I'm going to use a different set of arguments. I'm not going to give up. 
Um, hot plug support. So this is about cinder volumes. Um, if you have a volume and it's attached to the time you boot the image, it's attached, great. Your kernel hopefully is configured properly with the right drivers, it sees the, the block device, configures it, mounts it, and you're off to the races. But you don't want to have to reboot an instance every time you add a volume. That's one of the cool things about senders. I can dynamically add and remove volumes. But your, your OS has to support that. So for Linux, that basically means you have to have uh, hot plug support available in the OS. A lot of kernels come with this either statically compiled or already available. If the one you're using doesn't, it's, it's pretty simple to enable it. Basically, you need two modules to be enabled. Um, uh, the uh, ACPI PHP module and the PCI underscore hot plug module. If you make those available, once your OS is booted and you attach a volume, if you look at your kernel log, what you'll see is it'll say, oh, look, I've detected a new SCSI device. I'm configuring it, making it available, great. Once you've unmounted it and you do the detach through sender, then you'll see it say, oh, hey, this disappeared. I'm cleaning it up and all that sort of stuff. And works fairly reliably. Putting it all together. So um, been up here talking for almost 40 minutes now about different things. Um, what does it all mean? Well, this is kind of the one sheet that talks about this is what we do. One, we use AMIs. We store all our images and glances as AMIs with associated AKIs and ARIs. Why do we do that? We do that because an AMI's raw disk format has no partition structure. That means that Cloud Init has an easy time resizing the file system to be the maximum size of whatever you've set your disk to. So this means we can actually store something like 100 meg AMI, because that's all the data that we need, and then the flavor can say 100 gigs, and it's simple. Nova sets the QCAL2 file size to be 100 gigs, and then CloudNit says, all right, I'm growing that file system out to the maximum size that's available. That allows us to store very little data in the image, only what's needed, but support a wide range of actual disk sizes. Uh, we use raw-backed, dynamically allocated QCAL2 instance disks. Why? Raw does perform better, yes. Depending upon your use case, that could be as little as 3%. So why do we do this? Well, for one, it's faster instance launching. We don't have to copy the raw disk file every time we launch an instance. In a lot of cases in a cloud, you don't actually have tons and tons of different images. You have a lot of VMs, but you start from a, from a fairly base, well-curated set of instances. Over time, fairly quickly, in fact, all of those images get cached on your hypervisors, which means if you're using a, a, a raw-backed QCAL2, all you have to do is create basically a QCAL2 file that says, I'm backed by that make it dynamically allocated so I'm not spending time allocating blocks, and you launch. That, vast, that vastly improves the performance of launch time. It also increases storage efficiency. As I talked about earlier, because you don't have to pre-allocate those blocks, and you're based on the same backing file, you don't make multiple copies, you actually achieve a, a higher level of, of, of savings on, on consolidating your storage. And like I said, snapshots. Um, until recently, Basically, there was no, no good support for snapshots um, in, in, um, with RAWs. QCAL2s have it natively, has a better snapshot uh, infrastructure, and it's better tested. CloudNet, we use CloudNet. I spent a decent amount of time talking about it. Pretty obvious what the wins there are. It allows us to resize the file systems. It'll even re restructure your partition structure if you want. Um, and then, properly prepared OS. I talked about those things. What's our authentication model and why? How you prep some of the networking stuff and why? And then hot plug. How do you make it so that your sender volumes are, are dynamic? Um, and then finally, more information. So uh, the OMSAC conference is going to be posting a video of this talk as well as these slides um, at some point on their page. I have it already directly available. Um, there's a tiny URL for you guys. I guess it's not so tiny. Uh, there's my contact information. My email is there, slightly obfuscated, since this is going to be posted publicly. I'd prefer to not get spammed by automatic bots. Um, you can also catch me on Freenode. I'm C. Burgess. Um, I am an active contributor to the Nova project, so I hang out in a lot of the OpenStack channels. So just say, hey, C. Burgess, blah, 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 and, and chances are I'll respond. Um, you, can, you can catch me on Twitter if you want. And today, uh, or, well, during the conference, I'll actually be available at the MetaCloud booth 
which I have placed there because I didn't know where it was until just recently. The show floor is is you know just right out there in the in the B exhibit hall. Come in there, look for the booth that says MetaCloud on it, and um, these are the times I will be there. If you come up to me during these times and you ask me a question about this presentation or images in general, uh, we can talk uh, until we're blue in the face and geek out as much as we want about about this topic. I uh, you know I won't try and uh, pitch anything <laughs> about MetaCloud or anything like that. So. Um, so we have about five minutes, because I'm thinking I'm supposed to end at 12.40. Um, so I think we got a microphone. I can take some questions, or all right, I see your hand first. So. Mm -hmm. Um, so, okay, so the question, to repeat it, uh, both for the video and so everyone hears is, how do you handle high priority OS updates? Um, and then, you know, do you update all the VMs? Do you update the backing files? That sort of stuff. Um, good question. There's a lot of options there. Um, you, you could try and do something uh, where if you're using a Q how to pivot onto a new route. There's this notion of being able to, to take a Q how to and, and chain backing files and, and recompress them. Um, that is something you'd have to do by hand. There's no support for that in Nova at all. This notion of pivoting onto a new root or chain, uh, well, Nova can support chained backing files, but there's no API call to do that. Um, so because of that, because it'd be a manual process, our recommendation is to do one of two things. One, if, if your instances are truly ephemeral, if, if you've really orchestrated your application, your use of the cloud, right, and all your instances are ephemeral, build a new image and roll through and, and move to that. Um, the other one is use your configuration management system. Hopefully, if you're running a cloud, especially at scale, you've got a good configuration management system, and you can use your configuration management system to push out your security updates or your regular updates. Um, but yes, to answer your question at the underlying level, you, you could do that. You have to be careful with is the instance running um, and keeping the, a consistent directory structure. But, but since there's no support in the APIs for that, we, we tend to shy away from that because again our goal with what we look at is is how can you build clouds with you know thousands of vms in them and and, and orchestrate all this through the apis uh you with the c <laughs> uh yeah. so you mentioned that flaws can be much faster but isn't that mostly specific to why don't you get huge uh, Yes. So the question is, um, I mentioned that RAWs were much faster. I said they have a performance game. I didn't actually say much um, for a reason. But um, and don't you get a benefit from having uh, a multiple backing uh, or, or multiple instances backed by the same backing file? Um, so yes to all of those things. So let me talk a little bit about that. Debating the performance wins of, of RAW versus QCAL2, I could have stood up here for 40 minutes and done an entire talk on that. There is a performance gain with RAW. As I've said, it's just a flat directory structure. So in that regard, you have no overhead of, of QCAL2 having to dynamically allocate blocks and that sort of stuff. How much of an overhead? Well, that kind of depends on your workload and what you're doing, right? How, how, how fast is it really? We've actually seen a, a single VM with a backend do 8,000 IOPS per second to a QCAL2-based file and do a little over 220 megabits per second to that file. So you can actually make QCAL2s run really fast if, if, if you set it up right. You also talked about, don't you get a performance gain from having multiple instances backed by the same raw? Yes, you do. Um, so we're talking about KVM and Kimu here. So that means we're running Linux on our physical host. Well, if you understand the way the Linux file, or Linux file system caching works, what happens is any available memory, aka memory that isn't being used by a user land process or the kernel for some specific task, the kernel views as a pool it can use to cache data. And one of the things it predominantly puts in there is a file system cache. So if you have 100 VMs running on a single physical machine, and they're all backed by a single physical file, that single physical file is basically kept by, by your kernel in your file system cache, assuming you have enough memory. So you get a performance benefit there. You've, you've cached, in essence, your entire file system. Now over time, those instances will start to diverge. Um, and so it becomes more difficult to do that. And you know, if your performance really starts to suffer, you need to look at, um, as I talked about earlier, either manually pivoting onto new routes, you can compress, um, or simply roll a new image that contains all the updates you've made and, and, and roll through your cloud and, and, and change onto those. So um, any more questions? Over there, yes, you, sir. Mm-hmm. 
Yes. Uh, yes. So um, there are certain conditions where UDEV will regenerate those rules. Um, once the instance is booted, if it regenerates it, in theory, it's going to regenerate with the hardware address that it's got, and hopefully that doesn't change. Uh, yes, if you snapshot, you got to re-prep it and stuff. Um, so yeah, you either need to make sure it doesn't uh, uh, get removed, or I think one of the files I mentioned in there is the file that the generator uses to regenerate the MAC addresses, or th that portion. So if you remove that file, you can let UDEV rerun, because there's other things it can do for you, but it won't change the, the hardware stuff. Yes, a package update will re-add that. Um, that is true. Uh, I, I didn't cover that. So yeah, you have to make sure and be careful as you're using a snapshot to try and promote to an image that, that you kind of, what we recommend people do is if you're taking a snapshot and then you're going to turn that snapshot into an image, you, you want to run through before you promote that into a public image and make sure that it's been prepped properly and you haven't lost any of your prepping. And or if, if that box had been configured for some specific purpose, do you have a bunch of users you don't need anymore, a bunch of other applications that are now going to start that you don't need? So. Mm -hmm. That'll do the um, that'll do the uh, the uh, the resizing of the partitioning. Right. Yeah. It's not done automatically at first boot in the. Okay. That's good to know, though. Okay. Well, that's good to know. I actually did not know there was there was a version in, in Fedora. Cool. I think I saw. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. I think I saw some. Yeah. Oh, great. So there's a Dracut module for it now. Yeah, the whole thing's good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, some of this is, you know, is based on when we started working on it like yeah, 2 years ago, so. Like ago. Okay. Uh, so so there you go. So apparently when I talked about that only Ubuntu supports the repartitioning, it sounds like there's now a Dracut module, Cloud Utils, I think is you both mentioned it. So look for Cloud Utils. It sounds like it's part of Fedora, but maybe not in EPEL or in in the rel repos yet, but it's pretty easy to move a Fedora package over. So um, I think we have time for one more question. Is there down there? Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, parameterizing the username we use, or parameterizing ad additional user data? Yes. Yes, so Cloud init itself, actually, um, when it's pulling data from the metadata service, of which there's several, um, it's, it's fairly well documented. You can actually set a number of key and values uh, for user data that will change the way Cloud init behaves and what it'll do. Um, it's, it, the Cloud init URL I put up there has the documentation for that. There's, I think there's actually like 20 or 30 different m metadata keys it would understand and do something different and unique with. Um, so yes, that does work. Um, you can you can actually really get advanced with cloud in it and the metadata service and integrate those together and then have it bootstrap something like your chef or your puppet and and really get this kind of all the way through end to end provisioning and that's that's actually what what we encourage our clients to do right is this is the first step this is just getting you an OS that's running and now you, you Use the metadata. Use you know integrate it with your chef or your puppet puppet install and go all the way through. So, okay. Uh, thank you. We're out of time.